In front of me here is a calibration display. And it's a display that tells me something about how well the probability values of a classifier are calibrated. On the x-axis over here, we've got the mean predicted probability that's bucketed. And what you're kind of hoping is that if the probability is around 0.8, let's say, that then indeed around 0.8 of the items that we predict have the positive class. And, and in this particular case, you can see that we don't exactly have that property. In the ideal scenario, you would have a line over here that just very neatly fits this diagonal. And right here, we're dealing with a model that doesn't have that property. This is a uh, naive Bayes model, and it definitely seems to have a bit of bias. There's some overshooting happening at the beginning, and there's some undershooting happening here at the end. However, there is a remedy. What we could do is we could wrap around this underlying estimator and tweak the probability values in such a way that the calibration chart goes from looking like this and eventually looks a lot more like this. I should stress that this is a somewhat extreme example on some simulated data. In real life, the trick that I'm about to teach you doesn't always guarantee that you're going to be this smack dab on the diagonal line over here. But nonetheless, I do think that this technique is useful enough to be generally applicable. And in, in particular, uh, what we're going to discuss is this calibrated classifier CV estimator that allows you to wrap around an existing estimator to then give you an estimator that is just a bit better calibrated. Before diving into the technique on how this calibrated classifier exactly works, I figured I would just quickly show the code usage first. What I have over here is my original naive Bayes estimator. This has been trained on a train set, the same one that you see over here, by the way. And what you can clearly see is that I have this new estimator that really wraps around this old one. I can also give it some settings. We'll talk about this setting in a moment. But the main thing to observe is that really when I say wrap around, that is literally what's happening here. I have a new estimator over here, and I'm just doing some extra training on top. This gives me a new estimator, estimator underscore remedy. And it's this remedy estimator that I'm passing on to my calibration display. And notice that the x underscore calib, y underscore calib, uh, this is a separate set that I'm using for calibration. This is distinct from the training data over here. So this can be seen as a test set, basically. Everything else that you're seeing here is mainly just some settings to make sure the plot looks nice. But that's actually all you need to do to get a chart looking like this. There's this very convenient class that you can go ahead and import from the calibration submodule that handles a lot of this calibration stuff on your behalf. But instead of just merely appreciating that this technique works, it's also important to dive a little bit deeper and kind of understand how this technique works, because it can help motivate some of the settings that you might want to go for. So let's, on a high level, try and appreciate what is happening with the calibration chart. As said before, we have this diagonal, which is considered to be the ideal scenario. And quite typically, there's some overshooting followed by some undershooting happening as well. However, there is a interpretability at play here. The x values here are, in the end, representative of proba values that are being predicted from an estimator. On the y-axis here, we can measure how well that matches reality. But in general, we are talking about probability values, and this direction also has an interpretability. I would, in general, expect that if the classifier determines that there is a higher proba value, then it will be very surprising if reality deviates from it and actually returns a lower real probability. That would be quite strange. Put differently, you could argue that there is a monotonic relationship here. And this is also reflected by the line over here. There are moments when the line is more flat, but in general, the value either stays about the same or it goes up, but it will never ever go down. Now, the reason why that's a good observation to have is because that will also help motivate a machine learning model that can help us map the probability to the diagonal. You see, right now we have a system that takes a predicted value over here and then maps that to the y-axis. But maybe we can also do it the other way around. Maybe we can come up with a model that for every number that we have on the y-axis, it is able to map it to the diagonal over here. The reason why I'm mentioning this, by the way, is because you can kind of then start seeing this as a two-step approach, where first we make the prediction that a normal estimator might make, and then afterwards we apply some sort of a calibration model that can take the predicted value 
and normalize it back to the diagonal. However, because we are talking about a monotonic relationship here, we can be somewhat opinionated in the kind of machine learning model that we would use for this mapping. And in particular, I would like to highlight this technique called isotonic regression. Isotonic regression technically is a linear model, but the whole point of the model is to allow for monotonic relationships. The easiest way to quickly explain isotonic regression is just to go to the user guide on the scikit-learn docs. And if you give it a quick read, you will see that a isotonic regression tries to find the minimum value between the real y values and the predicted ones, maybe with some sort of a weight. If there is a number line, and if somewhere over here we've got xi in a way that it's less than some other xj, then the constraint guarantees that whatever value we predict for xi, yi in this case, that for whatever yj, we guarantee that it's either going up or it's remaining equal. Put differently, we are going to respect the monotonic relationship here. When we scroll down in the same user guide, you're going to see this image that does a really good job of explaining what is happening when you're doing isotonic regression. The blue dots over here consist of the training data. This green line over here in the middle, that's a normal linear regression. But this orange line over here depicts the actual prediction made with a isotonic regression model. You can see that there are these strong jumps as well. At some point, the value just kind of goes up. And we're definitely in the middle of all of these blue points over here. But this orange line, the more we move to the right, it can stay the same. It can go up, but it can never go down. This is a monotonic constraint that's being respected. And hopefully you can imagine that if you're dealing with a calibration chart, there is this monotonic relationship. So then maybe an isotonic regression model can be a model that we can use to calibrate whatever deviations back to the diagonal line. To showcase this, I've also made a small demo over here. Now, to explain the moving parts, the first thing that I'm doing up on top is I'm training an isotonic regression model. The model that I'm training here, by the way, is a model that goes from this y-axis over here to this ideal scenario. That's what I'm training towards. But I also have this input element over here that allows me to draw some sort of a shape, a shape that could be a calibration chart shape. And that shape is being drawn over here. However, I also have my isotonic regression model over here, and that model will do exactly what I just mentioned. It's going to make a prediction that hopefully will allow me to take this blue line over here and map it down to the diagonal. Maybe not perfectly, but hopefully in a somewhat numerically stable way. And that's what this red line over here represents. This red line that you see over here, that is the compensated line or the calibration effect, you could say. So just as kind of a fun demo of the monotonic effects, I figured I might make a bit of a change over here such that this original line for the calibration chart isn't monotonic anymore. I've added this gap. That is behavior that you wouldn't want to have in practice, because after all, the monotonic property is something that we're interested in. Thankfully though, because we're using isotonic regression over here, you can see that this red line, even though it does make a big jump over here, it definitely respects the monotonic behavior that we're interested in. In this segment that's kind of all over the place numerically where I've made this huge gap, it is definitely not the most accurate part of the line, but you can see that the parts over here that do respect the monotonic behavior on the blue curve, that we're able to actually get the red line smack dab in the middle where we'd like. And everywhere else we are able to guarantee monotonicity. So having a isotonic regression line over here can make a lot of sense when it comes to calibration. It should be said that there are also other methods that you can use. You don't just have to use isotonic regression. A very popular alternative is to go for a sigmoid function instead. In general, I would recommend preferring isotonic if you're able to. The main downside of isotonic regression is that it can overfit on small data sets. And in that case, having a sigmoid strategy could be useful. But isotonic regression to me feels like it's the most general solution out there. That said, there is one aspect that I should also mention before wrapping up this video, and that is the fact that whenever you're doing calibration with the calibration CV object, that there is also that CV term in the name. And we should mention some details about that. When you go to the documentation of the calibrated classifier CV object, you'll notice that there's actually a fair amount of inputs as well. There's the method where you can set sigmoid or isotonic as the way to do the calibration, but you'll also notice that this CV, which also appears in the name, by the way, 
is also something that you can set. So something with cross-validation definitely is happening here, and there's a little detail there that's actually worth diving into a bit. So we have our estimator, and that is something that we are very much interested in calibrating, but there's also some training data. Now, what you can imagine, if we are calibrating, then it can be a risk to do all of that on a separate train set. From a methodology perspective, it definitely feels good to maybe do some cross-validation here instead. So in the default behavior, we split the train set up into five different segments. First, we're going to select the first segment as the quote-unquote test set. This is going to be the train set for the first validation round. And that is going to give us our first estimator. That means that internally, this estimator can be retrained, which also means that this estimator can make some proba predictions, and then we can also chain an isotonic regression after that that can do the calibration. Now, we're not going to do that once, we're going to do that a whole bunch of times. And in doing so, we're going to have a bunch of these estimators, a bunch of these proba predictions, and then also a bunch of these isotonic models. In doing so, I hope it's clear that we actually have an ensemble of models at our disposal by the time that this calibration object has done training. And it's this ensemble of isotonic models that will make calibrated predictions and the average of all of these will be reported back to the end user whenever we call predict proba on this calibration object. As you can imagine, there's actually a fair amount of nuance and details related to all of this, depending on the size of the data going in, how many cross-validations do you pick, and how do you want to do cross-validation? Do you want to retrain this estimator inside yes, no? And these are all parameters that you can set, and there can be good reasons to deviate from the default. But it is good to know that when you're doing calibration for binary classification, then the calibrated classifier CV object is definitely doing some cross-validation internally. In a lot of cases, you should see an improvement with regards to calibrated predictions whenever you're using this object, but definitely feel free to continue making these calibration charts and to actually do your own benchmarks as well. The devil is always in the details, even when we have remedies available if the calibration seems off initially.